to all who need comfort, to all who need friendship, to all who are lonely and need companionship, to all who need sheltering love, to all who sin and need a savior. John Gray Memorial Church opens wide its doors and in the name of the Lord says, Welcome. 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 It's so great to have you here at John Gray Memorial Church in the Cayman Islands. It's a wonderful day for the people of God to connect in worship and in praise. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Come, friends, let's sing in worship to Almighty God. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can never tell it goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest head the guilty pair bowed down with care God gave his son Father God, we come before you and we, we give you thanks and we adore you, Lord, because you are worthy. Lord, from the beginning of creation, Lord, um, to the day of redemption, Lord, when you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us, Lord, you have been perfect in all your ways, Lord, and God, outside of you, Lord, we are nothing. And so, God, I pray that, um, Lord, we would continue to just dwell on those truths of who you are, Lord. A holy and just God, but also a loving and perfect Father. And Father God, we confess before you our sin, Lord. Um, not only the things that we have done against you, Lord, but the things that we have failed to do. But I ask that you would um, 
help us to look to the cross and to be transformed by it, Lord, that you would forgive us of our sins and that we would go and that we would sin no more, that we would live lives transformed by the blood of Christ. And so, God, we ask that you would um, just take these, these prayers of adoration and confession, Lord, and be pleased with them, Lord, and that, Lord, you would um, create in us a clean heart to do the things that you have called us to do as your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, holy, holy, holy be thy name. Our Father who art in heaven, holy, Give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us our trespasses. Hey guys, it's Mr. Etheridge here. I just wanted to give a quick intro to the video that I'm going to be showing you today. It's on a word called exile. And in today's Bible verse in 1 Peter, um, Peter addresses the people as exiles in the dispersion. And so we're going to learn a little bit more about what it means to be in exile as a Christian. So let's watch this video and let's find out. There's something about being home, where everything's just right. We're surrounded by people we love and trust. There's a feeling of stability and safety. And while some people get to experience this kind of home, many do not. Others might even be forced to leave their home and go live in a foreign land. We call this going into exile. Yeah, in exile, everything is disoriented. You're in the unknown. And in the story of the Bible, this is where the ancient Israelites found themselves conquered by Babylon, living in exile far from their homeland. And so they had to ask themselves, how did we end up here? And is there any hope of going home? And the whole story of the Bible is designed to address those very questions. The whole story? Really? Yeah, go back to the first pages of the Bible. Where does humanity live? OK, they live in this really sweet garden, their home. And they're there on one condition, that they trust and follow God's one command, and they don't. 
And so the consequence is banishment from the garden. Ah, they're sent into exile. Exactly. And so this story has been designed to set you up for Israel's story, how they were given the gift of the promised land and were able to stay there on one condition, that they be faithful to the terms of their covenant relationship with God. Um, They didn't, and they were sent into exile. And if you still don't see the parallel between exile from the garden and exile from Israel, think about this. In Genesis, humanity's exile led up to the story about the building of what city? Oh yeah, Babylon. The same place the Israelites are sent. But that's not the end of either story. In the first Babylon, God called Abraham to leave and travel to the Promised Land. And that story was designed to give hope to the Israelites currently living in the later Babylon. Now eventually, they do get to leave and travel back to their promised homeland. And when they did, It wasn't home sweet home. Oppressive empires were still ruling over them, and the people kept acting in the same corrupt ways as their ancestors. And so the biblical prophets said that exile wasn't actually over. How could they think they were still in exile when they're at home? Yeah, this is really important. In the Hebrew scriptures, Israel's Babylonian exile became an image of something more universal. It's that feeling of alienation and longing for something more, no matter where you live. Yeah, I I can relate to this. I have a great home, but it's situated in a world scarred with pain and broken relationships, death, tragedy, done by others, but also done by me. And so in the Bible, exile is the human condition. We all keep repeating this pattern of human corruption leading to a Babylon that we can't escape. And it doesn't matter where you live, we are all longing for a better home. Now Israel's scriptures held out hope that one day God would send a king who would rescue the world from all of the Babylons we've created. And after many generations pass, we meet this Israelite named Jesus of Nazareth. He wandered about with no home, announcing the great restoration, that reality of home that Israel and all humanity has been looking for. Yeah, Jesus really cared about people who didn't have homes. He welcomed in the stranger. He said God's love is shown when you invite in the outcast and throw parties for people who don't have a place to belong. Jesus also claimed that Israel and all humanity had lost its way, that our self-centeredness drives us to create false homes based on status and power, and these inevitably exclude others. We live in an exile of our own making. But Jesus said the true way home is one of weakness, of service, and of forgiveness. And then Jesus went into exile alongside us to show us the true way home. Which is? Well, Jesus said he is the way. His life and self-giving love proved more powerful than humanity's failure. He opened up a pathway to our real home. And as Jesus' followers committed themselves to him, they discovered this new way of being human. They believed that the real return from exile had begun. And so they would call themselves sojourners or wanderers. Oh right, they would say things like, the world isn't our home and we're citizens of heaven. And so Jesus' followers remain exiles as they wait for that day when Jesus returns to transform this world into a true home. Hello friends, we are glad that you have chosen to connect with us in worship today. If this is your first time sharing with us at John Gray Memorial Church here in the Cayman Islands, we offer a special welcome. Do let us know how you are doing or if there is any way we could support you. If there is any way that we could serve you, we would love to know. Please drop us a note so that someone can make contact with you. Also, please reach out to others in this time of isolation, especially those who are elderly or who live alone. You are invited to participate in one of our online Bible study groups this week. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, or our website for details on how to connect. Also, join the whole United Church across Cayman and Jamaica this and every Wednesday between 12 noon until 1 p.m. for prayer. Wherever you are at that time, Pause and share with us in prayer for a stop to the spread of the disease, healing for those who are infected with the disease, strength for our health care systems and workers who are on the front line of care, all elderly persons and those with comorbidities, 
those with needs and those who have lost or will lose their jobs, our local and world economies. Thanks for your continued generosity in giving of our resources in this time, in this season of special need. Our congregation remain dependent on your tithes and offerings to meet our regular responsibilities. At the same time, we have increased our outreach to the community with assistance to families who are in need during these uncertain times. If you are able, please utilize online banking or direct deposit to pass on your gift to our CNB account. You can memo if it is a designated gift. Otherwise, contact our church office to drop off or hold on to your offering until we are able to meet together again. This week, please reach out and share birthday greetings with Doreen Gordon. Also, join us in celebrating the wedding anniversary for Marcia and Stanley Foster. If you are celebrating a special occasion or just celebrating life, we celebrate with you. Please stay safe and be kind to someone this week. This morning... Our scripture reading is taken from 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 12 to 14 and chapter 5 verses 6 to 11. 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 12 to 14 and chapter 5 verses 6 to 11. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Chapter 5, verses 6 to 11. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power for ever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One way to describe the season in which we live is that it is a time of suffering. 
Now, suffering might be described as a state of undergoing pain or distress or hardship. And of course, that can be physical, psychological, spiritual, or a combination of the above. To some extent, everyone is facing some kind of distress at this time. But the truth is, at every point in history, people have faced hardship of some kind or the other. We can't avoid it completely, and it comes as just simply a part of life. That seems to be the point of 1 Peter chapter 4 when he writes, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. In other words, he's telling his readers to expect it, for it is as certain as death and taxes. But the writer also wants to remind them that they are not alone in their suffering. So he writes later in chapter 5 verse 9, For you know that your brothers and your sisters all over the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering as you are. Maybe one of the things that might help us through this time is the knowledge that we are united in our suffering, that we really don't suffer alone. But notwithstanding all of that we have said, it shouldn't leave us with the license to do two things when we talk about suffering. On the one hand, we should not equate all suffering. The degree to which we might be impacted by distress and pain and hardship is certainly not equal. If you only listen carefully, if you pay attention around you, you will know that some persons now are experiencing hardships in unimaginable ways. And of course, this is on top of the many, many who are in a bad way long before COVID-19. So we might do well then to distinguish between discomfort, inconvenience and disruptions on the one hand and imprisonment, despair, heartbreak, hunger, loss on the other. A look at the context of our text makes that point. For during the time of Peter, Christ's believers were experiencing fierce persecution in a number of ways. They could be mocked because of their practices that were considered strange, or they could become isolated from their families because they had joined up with this new movement, or at a deeper level, they could suffer at the hand of the state, a state that organized the persecution of these believers, even to the point of death, so that not all suffering then is equal. But also, we should not mistake the universality of suffering for the necessity of it. Not because everyone suffers means that it is a required evil. Jennifer Colland points out that the relationship between suffering and faith should not be understood as determinative. In other words, suffering is not necessary for one to have faith. Suffering is not necessary to be considered faithful. Suffering is not necessary to build one's faith. For not all suffering is redemptive or has an intrinsic value to the person who is bearing the pain. So what then does Peter offer to us as a perspective that might assist us to live and thrive in the midst of difficult times? no matter the nature of the suffering or the necessity of it. Let me point out three things from the text. Firstly, note that the foundational premise for Peter's argument in verse 1 of chapter 4 is since Christ has suffered in the flesh. In other words, Christ also suffered. For him, that reminder should help the community undergoing its challenges to connect with Christ to connect with our shared participation as members of Christ's family. For you see, the connection is not only the shared experience of suffering, it is a fact that we share a common name. Our suffering is an expression of our shared identity. How we choose to identify ourselves is always significant, for oftentimes we describe ourselves in terms of our relationships to others, that we are a partner, or a parent, or a child, or a sibling. But identifying who we are is important to solidify the group identity. You and I know how important that is where we live. For people often determine a lot about us by our family name. So what does it mean to call ourselves Christian? Admittedly, it means different things to different people in different places. When it was first used, the term Christian was a kind of a curse word, a pejorative at best. 
So the writer of First Peter is exhorting the audience to embrace the name of Christ as a badge of honor and not of shame. To be a Christian means belonging to a set-apart group, a people who are God's chosen people. And given that understanding, he's expecting that our response then should not just be to endure or to put up with suffering, but rather to embrace it as a mark of identity, our identity as people who suffer with Christ. And so arm ourselves by keeping that insight as a guide for life in this world. So this then is not meant to be a mark of sadness or shame. Instead, it constitutes a blessing. He writes, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the Spirit of God is resting on you. The bearers of the name are not only identified by the particular beliefs that they have, but by the particular behaviors that they exhibit. Our persistence and our joy in the midst of hard times identify us as Christ's followers. But secondly, hear how he speaks about the duration of the suffering. In verse 6, he admonishes, Humble yourself therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. And then when he gets to verse 10, he promises that the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have finished or suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. In other words, there is an expected end to our time of pain. For weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Not only will suffering come to an end at some point, for it just won't last forever, but what is in store afterwards will cause us to all make sense of the experience. So that Paul writing to the Romans in chapter 8 and verse 18, expresses it in this way. What we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that God will reveal in us later on. Our suffering is limited to the reach of evil. Part of the problem is that we tend to think very globally about suffering. Have you ever asked someone, how are things? And they say, everything is bad. When in fact the problem is that they have burned their breakfast that morning. You see, when one thing is wrong or one set of things is wrong, it tends to shift the focus and impact all the other aspects of life. Partly, it's because some things can be so significant that they do affect all of life but also because we tend to be consumed by whatever brings pain into focus in our lives. So again, let us recognize that many are experiencing real distress and we must never minimize their experience. And also let us acknowledge that talking about the fiery ordeals that the early believers were suffering is not an experience that most of us in the 21st century church, especially in this side of the world, can really relate to. Our experience of church is largely one where we enjoy a cozy relationship with the power brokers of the world. We are accustomed to privilege and to being consulted and we expect deference and respect just because we are the church. But a Christ believer in the Roman Empire would be particularly challenging since the movement in, to which he belonged was organized around following Jesus' way, which was quite unsettling to the powers that be. So as a result, they would be very much in tension with the empire because their understanding of how they were to be as a community was in opposition to the dominant view of the, of the empire. So followers of Jesus were encouraged to develop communities in which differences in social status did not play as much a role in how they were organized as, as it did in the imperial world which surrounded them. So Jesus' followers preached the good news to the poor. They preached freedom to the imprisoned, sight for the blinded, and liberation to the oppressed. And all of this was seen as rejection of the prevailing power structures. And because of this, their message and practice were perceived as subversive. And the early believers were targeted 
and made to suffer. Yet they understood that those who were inflicting pain did not have the final word. Sometimes when you're under the thumb, it feels as if that wielder of power has ultimate control, but the experience of that moment does not constitute the full picture. It seems as if the writer of First Peter was saying. That is why we do not defer and deter from the work of justice to which we are called to bring an end to the structures of evil that inflict suffering on the people of God all over the world. For even though it might appear futile in the moment, we have the promise that God determines the final outcome and that good must triumph over evil. Part of our responsibility then as Christ believers is to determine that we are in solidarity with others, with those who suffer in the world because of Christ, and therefore we must resist the devil. And the evil one, the text tells us, is like a prowling lion that will not rest until he finds someone to devour. And since the devil is not resting, then neither should we. But finally, the writer highlights in verse 14 that those who are suffering are insulted because of the name of Christ. So that the torment and the hostility towards the church in the early, uh, the first century was profoundly related to the subversive role that they had. Since the Christian church no longer provokes hostility in the world that we live, it is often viewed that we are irrelevant or we are tolerated with polite indifference. So maybe here's a point. Our suffering should be born out of purpose. Could it be that we have moved away from the way in which the early church lived out their beliefs? First Peter reminds us that what was at stake in the sufferings of Christ's believers is not so much what they believed in, but what they did. Because they believed that Jesus was Lord and Caesar was not, then they strived to establish communities marked by love and solidarity rather than by hierarchy and a system of patronage and debt. So one suggestion from writers like De La Torre is that the church in our time might regain our relevance if we were to return to a focus on orthopraxis or correct action rather than orthodoxy or correct doctrine. If this were done, then maybe an outworking of that would be that we would inspire what he calls social disorder. But of course, it would bring threat, the threat of suffering at the hands of the privileged and the powerful. It would mean that we would have no certain immediate control over the outcome of that struggle, but it would place us on the side of Christ particularly participating in Christ's suffering and giving meaning to our work because of the name of Jesus Christ. My sisters and brothers, let me leave our conversation then with two words. A word to you as an individual. I don't know what you might be facing right now, but I want you to know that you are not alone. You bear the identity of Christ. You are connected with him and his suffering. Know too that what you are enduring will not go on forever. God will bring it to an end. Pray then for God's grace to not only endure, but to embrace the spirit in your life. And a word to our church community. Because we are connected through Christ, our commitment must compel us to work together to bring all suffering or suffering that hurt God's people every and anywhere to an end. Our work must be the work of Jesus, bringing good news to the poor, freedom to the imprisoned, sight for the blinded, and liberation to the oppressed. And we don't have to look far to find suffering. For even though the obvious might look okay, you just have to look beneath the surface. To see the real truth. Amen. This is my prayer in the desert. When
know that's within me feels dry This is my prayer and my hunger in me My God is a God who provides This is my prayer in the fire In weakness or trial there is a faith through the worth more than glow, so refine me, Lord, through the flames. I will bring praise, I will bring praise, no weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory in me. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. For new every morning is your love, our waking and uprising prove. Through sleep and darkness safely brought, restored to life and power and thought. Holy and most merciful God, during this time of challenge and uncertainty, we stop to recall your promise to Noah and his family as they too were locked down in the ark. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. And so we testify to your faithfulness, not only today, but in days past. And you have declared that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And so we give you all the praise and all the glory 
knowing that you will keep your promises. Thank you too for the ways that you continue to provide for your people, not only here in Cayman, but in our region and around the world. We put our families and friends into your care and keeping, O oh God, especially those who are far away from us. Be with those who are in the front line of danger. Be their shield and armor, their protective gear, their high tower. Provide for those that are in need in ways that only you can do. But while we give you thanks and praise, we become very conscious of our own shortcomings, our sin, and it seems that no matter how hard we try, we mess up. So we pray that you would create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Cast us not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from us. Restore our souls. Restore the joy of our salvation and lead us in the way everlasting. God of all blessings, open our hearts to receive all that you have for us. And once we have opened our hearts, help us as good servants to be generous to those around us. All these things we ask in the holy, precious, and powerful name of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, our Lord and friend, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. You're hidden. Jesus, you.